Hi friends, Pastor Doug Batchelor. We're gonna be talking today about a very important subject and an often misunderstood subject, the shocking truths regarding the Great Tribulation. Now, when we talk about the Great Tribulation in the Bible, most people are thinking about the Great Tribulation that comes at the very end of time, dealing with the seven last plagues. And we are gonna talk about that. But a lot of people misunderstand what Jesus is talking about when he addresses the Great Tribulation in Matthew chapter 24. He's actually covering three different time periods in this passage. So let's go to it right away. You look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, let those that are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down and take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes. And woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Well, Jesus here is using the very strongest possible language to describe a time of trouble unlike any other trouble. Now, Jesus is actually quoting from the book of Daniel. If you look in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as never been ever since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. There he's obviously talking about the book of life. So Jesus is hearkening back to the words of Daniel about this great time of trouble with a special focus on the end of time, but that's not the only time of trouble that he's referencing. There's a third reference where you find the great tribulation mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Then one of the elders answered and said to me, who are these arrayed in white robes? These are the ones who have come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So even Daniel, Revelation, and the words of Christ describe this time period called the great tribulation. But one thing I want to make very clear is the Lord does not want us to live in fear. There's probably 300 times in the Bible where God says, do not be afraid, do not fear, Jesus said, why were you afraid? Let me reemphasize this in the words of Christ. John 16, 33, Jesus said, These things I've spoken unto you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. If we have committed our lives to Christ, we should not be frightened by the truths about the great tribulation. I don't see awake at night and worry about the great tribulation. The thing I'm concerned about is I wanna make sure that I'm living day by day, abiding in Christ, and then he'll get me through the great tribulation. Now, if you have not committed your life to Christ, this ought to get you to sit up and pay attention because there's gonna be a real time of trouble coming upon the world. But let's back up and explain uh, what does the word tribulation mean? The word tribulation in Greek is the word thelipsis. And that simply means to press or to crush, as in pressure, to squash, to rub, as in friction, and to crush. It's talking about this time of crushing, this time of trial. In the Old Testament, it often uses a word that simply translates as trouble. Then it'll use a word, great trouble. So the great tribulation that Jesus is describing, you can find in Matthew 24, the disciples are showing Jesus all the different buildings of the temple. And uh, he shocks them by saying, do you not see all these things? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So the disciples come to him and they ask him basically three questions. They say, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Jesus, like the Old Testament prophets, he amalgamates, he combines and collates his answer into one discourse. You'll find with many of the Old Testament prophets, they often uh, talked about different time periods in one prophecy. So Jesus just carries on through Matthew 24. You'll also find this in Mark 13 and Luke 21. He describes these times of trouble. 
First of all, there is a time of trouble that is specifically talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Now, the Jewish nation has been through some really big times of trouble. Of course, the Bible tells us the nation was born out of a great tribulation called the Exodus, where all those plagues fell on ancient Egypt. The great time of trouble at the end of time has many of the same plagues that fell on the Israelites in the Exodus experience. Children of Israel went through a lot of tribulation with some of their neighboring nations, but principally when they were destroyed by the Assyrians, 10 of the tribes carried off to be captives in Assyria. When Nebuchadnezzar came down and he destroyed the temple and burnt the city of Jerusalem, and they were carried off to Babylon for 70 years, that was certainly a great time of trouble. And then you can look at what happened in the book of Esther. There's a death decree that all of God's people, the Jews, are to be executed on a particular date. And then of course, there was a great time of trouble during the Holocaust and other times in history. But the prophecy of Jesus here gives a special focus to a great time of trouble that was going to come on that generation, God's people, the Jewish nation. So look at what he says here in Luke 21. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its destruction, its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee into the mountains. Notice Matthew 24, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let those that are in Judea flee into the mountains. Here he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, what army surrounded Jerusalem? The Roman army in 70 AD, or even just prior to 70 AD, they came against Israel and Jerusalem in particular. Know the desolation thereof is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things that are written might be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and they'll be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled." And we, we've seen the nation of Israel reconstituted in this last century. Now, when you look in the prophecy of Daniel that you find in Daniel chapter 9 about the Messiah, notice what it says in verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That's Messiah, Jesus, but not for himself. He dies for us. And the people of the prince who is to come, the nation that would be executing Jesus, that's the Roman power, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's exactly what happened after the execution of Jesus. And the end of it shall be with a flood, meaning not a Noah flood of water, but a flood of armies that would come in. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. There you've got that desolation again that Luke spoke about. First time of trouble is talking about this terrible time of trouble that would come on the nation of Israel. Luke 23, verse 27. And a great multitude of people followed him. Jesus is on his way to the cross. Listen carefully who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus said, turning to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they'll begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Going back to Matthew 24, speaking of this time, Christ said, Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Look in Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all of the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, who you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So, this first great tribulation, Jesus said, is talking about a generation that was actually alive. He's speaking to the people at the cross, saying, on this generation, there's going to be great trouble that's coming because you're rejecting the Messiah. At least the nation did. Many Jews, of course, accepted Jesus, and the early apostles were all Jewish. 
those baptized at Pentecost were almost entirely Jewish, and then later when 5,000 were baptized. So the early church was composed of largely Jewish believers until Peter, Peter took the gospel to Cornelius and then Paul to the Gentiles. So, but as a nation, they were going to experience a terrible judgment. When Stephen preached to the Supreme Court, and you read about this in Acts chapter 7, and he presented the gospel, and the Bible says the religious leaders, the judges, plugged their ears, they gnashed on him, they took him out and stoned him. That was sort of a signal that the, na the nation had officially rejected the message of the gospel, and a terrible judgment was then to follow, and it came through the Roman power. He says this generation. Now, Jesus makes this prophecy in about 30 AD. A Bible generation is 40 years. And I think it's fascinating that you consider that uh, it was 70 AD, 40 years later, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled exactly. You can also read where he says, continuing in Matthew 23, where Jesus says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. What a frightful statement. And I want to repeat what it says here in Matthew 24, verse 2. When they were showing him the beautiful buildings of their national treasure, their temple, Jesus stunned them when he said, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Later in that same passage, he says, Matthew 24, verse 34, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Now, Jesus preached for three and a half years, and then 40 years later, Jerusalem was destroyed. Jesus said no sign would be given except the sign of Jonah. And he tells us in Luke, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Bible says when Jonah came out of the fish, and there's a resurrection here when Jonah comes out of the fish, you might say, like Christ, that Jonah then goes three days journey to Nineveh. He enters the city a day's journey. Jesus says, are there not 12 hours in a day? So a day was half of uh, the 24 hour period. So you got three and a half. And then Jonah says in 40 days, Nineveh would, would be destroyed but Nineveh repented and it was not destroyed. Jesus said the people of Nineveh would rise up against this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Notice that, Jonah three and a half days and then 40, Jesus three and a half years and then 40, but they did not repent. That's why Jesus said the people of Nineveh would rise up against the people of this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus the Messiah was there and as a nation they did not accept him. But don't forget, Paul said that while they might be cut off, they can be grafted back in again. And you can just look, there's a number of historians that describe it, but Josephus probably has the best. It's in the great Jewish revolt of 66 to 73 AD. The Romans besieged the city of Jerusalem. It tells us that the people were dying of hunger in large numbers, enduring unspeakable suffering. In every house, the merest hint of food sparked violence and close relatives fell to blows, snatching from one another the pitiful supports of life. No respect was paid even to the dying. The ruffians, meaning the anti-Roman zealots, they searched them. In some cases, they were searching for concealed food in their clothing, or just among those who they thought were pretending to be dying. Gaping with hunger like mad dogs, lawless gangs went staggering and reeling through the streets, battering upon the doors like drunkards. So bewildered they were, they broke into the same house two or three times in an hour. Need drove the starving to gnaw at anything. Refuse, which even animals would reject, was collected and turned into food. In the end, they were eating belts and shoes and leather, and they even turned to cannibalism. That's why Jesus said, woe to the mothers that are bearing children. They were eating the strips off their shields of leather. Tufts of withered grass were devoured and sold in little bundles for four drachmas. Josephus reports that during this time while they were resisting the Roman army and the Romans were gathered outside, that the Romans would collect and crucify up to 400 or 500 Jews each day, trying to inspire them to surrender the city. They crucified so many Jews around Jerusalem that Josephus reports there was no wood left in the area for this purpose. But finally, when Jerusalem fell, it says, the Romans went in numbers into the lanes of the city, 
and with their swords drawn, they slew those that they overtook without mercy. And they set to fire the houses whither the Jews were fled. They burnt every soul in them, and they laid waste to many of the rest. He goes on to say, Now the number of those that were carried captive during this whole war was collected to be 97,000, as was the number of those that perished during the whole siege, 1,100,000. After the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the fall of Masada, they annexed Judea as a Roman province and they systematically drove the Jews from Palestine. This led to the great diaspora following the Roman, uh, Romans conquering it. They burnt the temple, which was their national treasure. And as the fire of the temple melted the gold within the, the inner sanctum and the holy place, it seeped into the cracks. The Romans later, in wanting to recover the gold, They plowed the ground, they overturned every stone, so there was not left one stone upon another that was not thrown down. Today you can go to Jerusalem and you can see pictures of those massive stones. Some have been left there as a memorial of what happened during the Roman siege. So this first great tribulation that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 is talking about the fall of Jerusalem and the sacking of Jerusalem by the Romans and the terrible persecutions and sufferings that the Jews went through during that time. In our next segments, we're going to be talking about a great persecution that came upon the church and then ultimately the great persecution at the end of time, time of trouble such as there never has been. We know that Daniel is talking about the very last days because he says it's connected with the resurrection. So friends, stay tuned. If you've enjoyed this study and others like it, click like and share it with your friends. If you have no friends, share it with your enemy. They might become your friends.